Hello, Silas here, and this is Dishing on Dish, which is a series where I talk about food with people, and it's been mostly Steven, almost exclusively Steven, we're okay. getting more people on this, where we talk about certain restaurants and specifically the food from those restaurants, and we go into more details about how that food was made, things about the background, where it's from, the ingredients, and then we just kind of go off into different places. So Steven, could you please tell us about what we're going to be talking about today? Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Today, we're going to be resuming our discussion about Felidia, my last place of employment. It was a, we could say broadly Italian, but that could be picked apart a little a restaurant on the Upper East Side, now closed, unfortunately. I do have a lot of fond memories of working there, though, so I compiled a list of the dishes that I particularly liked. And I also wanted to point out, want to point out, as I did last time, that a number of these dishes are still on the menu at Babo, which is still open. So if any of these dishes catch your eye, I'd recommend going there and checking them out. And, you know, hopefully um, also check out the cookbook, which I have right here next to me. Felidia cookbook, and um, hopefully you can get some inspiration from that and you know, maybe even come up with some new ideas. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. So with this dish, your dish, this is a sub-series within the You Are What You Consume series, and the general premise for the You Are What You Consume series is that you are what you consume. So it's taking in the fats and the carbohydrates and the proteins that actually make the bodies and make living creatures and forms and things on Earth. And this goes further into like, okay, what why did certain foods be made? Why were there certain decisions that made these foods? What What's the culture that's around this? Because there's lots of things, a lot of the, this is something that I kind of disagree with, but people often say this, oh, we need diversity in this, so we can have different restaurants. Technically, you can be from any actual place and learn how to cook, and you can see the things that Stephen mentioned with the cookbook. You can learn that, and you can look in there, and you can try to attempt that thing. So you don't necessarily have to be from a place, but there is something about certain food that was developed in certain locations that does inform you about the locations that were made, the nature that was there, the biology and the, <laughs> the vegetables and things like that. So it's kind of good to, um, we try to get into some of that. We find our ways getting into some of that in this particular food related conversation in the dish on dish, whereas you are what you consume is just about other things in it. Like for example, with this for Lydia series, um, there's a different talk that we had talking about the end of Lydia, and it was a 40, it was it was open for 40 years in New York City. As Stephen mentioned, it was the last place that he was, uh, uh, he worked at, and he was assistant manager there. So we had an entire talk, and that one was more just about the food industry in um, New York City, about different challenges that people have with businesses, especially with the pandemic going on and things like that, the current pestilence. So that was something where, that's something that's more talking about food now, this is specifically talking about actual dishes. And with this one, a big positive about doing some of these ones, this recent one with Lydia and the previous one that we did. Okay, we, we before that we did Casa Lula, which was not, not one that he worked at, but Seasonal, which he worked at before. He can tell us more details from having actually worked and known the people who are actually in the kitchen and making some of these dishes and things like that. Yeah. So with this one, there's a lot more... Um, how was he in depth? There's a different, he brings a different facet by actually having have worked at these places. And we also recently did a talk with another friend of Steven's, uh, he's also called Steve, and he was telling us about his restaurant in uh, Costa Rica. We might even do yep. like a dish or a dish about that restaurant himself. But he's yeah. also somebody that's worked in the back and he can come on and talk about other places that Steven and him worked together. So it's just, it's just kind of what we have with this idea of this series and we're growing it and we'll get other people on there. Uh, one of the things we normally ask at the end of this is there any other restaurants that y'all have had, have gone to, and in New York City area, that's where Stephen is now. I'm currently in Nairobi, Kenya, but we'll we'll start expanding this thing. There's places that you suggest. Stephen is always open to taking new suggestions on to different places to uh, take his gourmand self around to. So um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for this intro. If you want to listen to a lot more about this restaurant, I think Stephen will just give us a quick overview now, but you can check out that episode that we have talking about uh, the Felidia closing. And then the previous part one of this dish on dish, where we're talking about the dish itself, where he goes into a little more extended about it. So I think for today, if you can just tell us the, the basics with the things we normally talk about, it's like the place, and the content and the, for the place we talk about location tables and ambiance the content we normally go about menu fixed price combo and this, whether it's, it's seasonal or varied and then we talk about the cookbooks and things like that so just give us a quick overview of that unfortunately it's closed but you can tell us a bit about that before we get into the dishing 
Sure. So the restaurant Felidia opened in the early 80s, I want to say 1983. So it wasn't quite 40 years, but pretty close to it. Uh, this was my my former boss, Lydia Bassianich, this was her flagship. The name came from a combination of her late her ex, late husband, uh, Felix, or Felice is the original Italian name, and uh, her name, Lydia, so Phil Lydia, that's where that comes from. It was a very family-oriented restaurant. She used to work in the restaurant. He used to uh, play an accordion and sing, actually. And Lydia's mother used to actually work coat check in the front desk. Pretty cool. So it, it, it had a good run. Unfortunately, they divorced, I want to say, like, early 2000s or something, and he passed away like mid, later 2000s, so I never got to see him or anything. Uh, Lydia's mother also passed away, I think, last year. She made it to 100, though, really impressive. Uh, she definitely had a big impact on her daughter's career and it, um, just career path and lifestyle in general. Um, unfortunately, the place did close a combination of, I think, the lockdown, but also I think Lydia is getting up there in years, and she just doesn't want as much responsibility, and she still has her show and other businesses. So my sense is she's probably just focusing on those and kind of winding it down. And, I mean, as I've said before, the majority of restaurants fail within a year or so. I mean, almost 40 years is epic when you consider lifespan. I mean, obviously, I wish it were still open, but, I mean, nothing lasts forever, as they say. Uh. Yeah. And as Stephen mentioned, the menu is a bit – varied in different kind of places but it's just that's that's a kind of thing that you see as i mentioned you don't need somebody to be from a certain location in order to actually make that food you personally can attempt to make many sorts of dishes nothing like genetically inherent about people who were born in oaxaca that can they're the only ones that can make tacos or something there's <laughs> nothing inherently about people who are born in like india to say oh you're the only ones who can do rotis and i that's that's part of I think there's, there's, there's a part of, um, of this sharing of information and then everything in life is appropriation. Like we appropriate certain calories, we appropriate fats, carbohydrates, and uh, proteins from the foods that we eat and we make them a part of us. And I think this ability to actually share cuisines, share the ideas and share the information about why certain foods are made, why they've been made. I think there's, there's a reason there's an importance. I mean, we all eat, that's one of the few things. But there's, a, there's an, I think, an extra reason why there is that level of, of popularity with some of this food content, like the Food Network exploding, people making things online, things like Yelp, where people just get super excited to just go on and, and uh, to talk about foods from other places. Things like where people go on Instagram, they're taking their photos and things like that. There's, there's something that's appealing outside of just a simple thing that we know we get to consume something in order to actually build ourselves up. I think there's something extra in there about talking about food, knowing about food, sharing the, the, the recipes. I'm more of the person who is going for like more information. So I'm kind of going away from that whole, like, oh, it's a secret recipe. I like the, the fact that people are like, look, this is what we make. This is, you, you have the cookbooks. You can come try this. You can try it at a restaurant. You can make it in your home. This, that's, I think, is, is, it's a key part. Once we have like, okay, it's not Italian cooking. It's not French cooking. It might have originated in Italy back in the day, but it's just like human food. It's just earthling food. It's just what we eat. I think we get into the where the term that we don't necessarily like using fusion, where it's, there's no more fusion. There's just no more borders between the things. It's like, oh, you get a certain dish from a certain location, but then it's, it's cooked in a certain style. A different spice comes in and we've talked about that in previous ones we're like oh this looks like it's a dish or this is a name from somewhere else and you're like yeah when the people invented this this was never even like a thing that they had thought of like this was a plant yeah. from like an entirely different continent but now it's like a primary part of this and um i don't know i don't know if that's specifically united states of america because some of you all out there could think what do you necessarily think is american food yet there's a lot of american food that you might think of that is actually technically kind of sort of Americanized versions of dishes that were established in other locations. And I don't necessarily consider that a bad thing. In most of those cases, I consider the one of the way it originated to be better. But then when it comes to something like Chinese food, there's no general sauce chicken, but that's probably like my favorite thing to order mm -hmm. if I'm in like an actual Chinese food place in the United States of America. So there's different, different things in there that, uh, that, yeah, we can kind of um, just think about. Well, yeah. I have this recurring conversation with the based Korean lady because she was the one who said to me, you look Eastern European, not white. And she keeps asking me if I like Eastern European stuff. I'm like, to a point, but you notice by my posts, I eat a lot of French stuff. She's like, oh, you're not going to honor your heritage. I'm like, I don't eat food based on where my ancestors came from. I eat food based on what I enjoy because she's big into Korean food. And I was like, I like Korean food too. But, um, you know, then, but like, you know, I mean, 
I like French stuff. I mean, lately I've been going back to some Italian places. Um, we, you know, Andrea and I went to the Russian tea room. We're going to check out another Russian place we were supposed to this week, but um, plans fell through. But I mean, you know, I've been looking into some of that stuff. I mean, I, I don't see because my ancestors came from here. I have to eat this. And again, as you said to yourself, I mean, where did those dishes come from originally? I mean, Austrians copied the Italians with a schnitzel and they have served goulash, which is Hungarian. And it's like, you know, what is like, unless you can trace a dish back to Austria, you know, centuries ago and it wasn't even Austria, then what is Austrian food, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. with those things, of course, they are those, those kind of diets, what they call the paleo, paleo, paleolithic diet and things like that, yeah. and paleo and things like that. There are aspects in that. You can research and see, and there's definitely things. If you lived in a certain location, a certain ge geographical area under a certain climate, you were, you were exposed to a certain amount of sunlight, certain uh, things in the environment. Like So you'd have certain foods that over time would select for this organism to better survive and be, be, be strong in this environment. But that also involved probably walking and exercising a lot more, probably involved having like different quality of water, having like being exposed to different sorts of insects and, and challenges to your diet. So some people would be like, okay, We've been living in the United States of America for hundreds of years now, but we're still going to eat like like Korean food. Based Korean later might might be more like mm -hmm. close to generation wise, but there's many other things that went along to developing that that don't necessarily play a part. And then some of the ingredients that they're using for these Korean dishes might not, as we mentioned, might not actually be based on those Korean things. So you might still have limitations to the actual um, to the actual benefits that those original diets were giving you. Yeah. your body because first of all your body is in a different location you can supplement things with different things you can swap out as i mentioned you can swap out certain things with other things you can go in and do those full-on genetic tests that can tell like for some people if they eat broccoli they their body won't break it down in an effective way and it'll store fat whereas if they have ice cream their body will work on it th those kind of things where it's like a simple thing there's people who are lactose intolerant yet many of the dishes in the location they are genetically, ethnically from have cheese, but they can't have the cheese. So there's these kind of things to kind of consider that, um, but I think this this whole information age and understanding of, of things in a better way, which is one of my benefits, or one of the things I've really enjoyed from this dish on dish series. And those are the kind of things that we get into. If you enjoy anything that we're talking about here, we have at least six or seven other restaurants with multiple parts of those um, that, are, that are already out that you can definitely check out and enjoy, yeah. Yeah, so mm. next next week I'm actually going to Baba with my mother and a few other friends. I booked a seven top, so that could be a, cool. an upcoming presentation too. So uh, definitely I'll, I'll be sure to take a ton of photos. And I've been there twice. I went once on my own. I went once with Andrea more recently. So, um, you know, maybe get some photos from that too. I mean, I, I don't know if I want to do that right after this one because it's similar, but I think it would be a good follow-up at some point because we could, again, sort of keep that legacy alive. Plus, Babo has a lot of its own dishes too. So it'd be interesting yeah. to compare and contrast, see how the styles are, Felidia versus Babo. Yeah. Most definitely. And then uh, we yeah. can also, yeah, get to, we'll see if we can get them to give, They, I mean, they probably won't go into like the levels of details that you as a Gourmand go into, but hmm. it'll be good to get uh, some just input from the people who are in there or anybody who's been on that. If they want yeah. to like guest on this talk, we can, we can test that out. But yeah, that, that's it. Yeah. And all, all, also too, it's interesting to have the same, um, have multiple people try the same dish and to hear different people's takes on it. Like, like how it shows how your palate develops over time. Cause you'll think something is good. And somebody will say like, this needs a touch of vinegar. And then you put a touch of vinegar and you're like, wow, it's better now. So there's little things like that too. And I mean, it's the same probably in art or music or something. I mean, if you're starting off, something sounds good to you, but someone who's been in the business who really knows quality, they can tell you do this. It'll enhance it. You hear it you're like, wow, that's a lot better now. So I think that perspective is always good too. So. Yeah, most yeah. definitely. So I think now we're good to get into the into the yeah. meals, right? Into the yep. food. Yep. And when we do this, our faces normally go off of the screen, so our faces shall be departing the screen right about now, and yep. um, then you'll be able to just see the food that we're talking about on the screen. Uh, he normally just sends me a document, and I read through the names of the food, and then yep. he I kick it to him, and then he tells us a bit more about the food, and then we just get into discussion from it. So uh, the first one we have today, we were about halfway through the document, so we should be able yeah. to get this done. We normally aim for about an hour and a half per yeah. session with these. Sometimes we go longer, but that's normally around there. Okay, so the first one we have here is a black ink risotto with calamari, ricotta, and 24-karat gold. Yeah, this was very interesting, I thought, because 
I, this wasn't actually here when I was working, but I saw it and I just really caught my eye. I think it was on the Felidia page, and we were, we were talking about putting gold on food uh, and how we think it's overrated, but I thought it looked kind of cool. So black ink risotto, um, typical risotto, the Carnaroli rice, stock, butter, finish, all this. You put in a bit of squid ink to give it the color. I don't know what your thoughts on squid ink are. We've had in a few other things. I'm not crazy about it. I mean, I think it's more for color. I mean – for me, like it kind of smells funny, and like if you get it on anything, like you you have to throw that clothing out because it's almost impossible to get out. Um, but some people just like the black color; they think it's really cool. Ricotta, uh, calamari. I'm not sure the calamari is cooked here if it's poached or something. It looks like, and then there's actually a gold spray that you just spray over the top of it. Um, I guess this was a special or something at one point, or it was for a holiday. I'm not sure, but I thought it was kind of cool, but kind of gaudy at the same time. So I thought it'd just be interesting to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely gaudy. I can't, I can't remember even knowing. I can't think up, think up the taste of black ink, black squid ink. I can, it's more, it's black more. Ink? It's like all ink. Yeah, go ahead. It's, it's more. Uh... I mean, if you were to taste it on its own, it has a distinct, like, fishy, funky kind of flavor. But typically, you just put a little bit in for color because the idea is more of a color than flavor. I mean, it's like saffron or something. Like, if you eat a lot of saffron, it'll definitely taste like something. But the whole point is the coloring. It's not supposed to be, you know, it's like you don't want the thing to taste exclusively like that. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, because I've, I've had it maybe once or twice, a few times, but definitely can't can't uh, think of a taste. So I can't really give too much input on that. And now that that white is like a ricotta sauce or something. Or something. Yeah, it's, it's, like a, a, it's a soft, it's a soft ricotta it? that, well, no, I think it's just a softer ricotta that gets put on top and it kind of melts from the heat of the risotto and the calamari. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you said it was special. So I'm wondering, like, what? what yeah, do they now? Do they use black ink? Because we've talked about this before, also. Uh, that normally they you have a situation where you're going to use ingredients at least. It's a, a better to do in like three things at least. Then the cost benefit analysis of you actually purchasing that is makes sense. So with this one, but if it's a special, maybe it was just for some reason. I'm guessing they're also breaking down their own squid at the location. So if you're getting a whole squid, you're going to have the access to the ink sack as well. So maybe sometimes it's like, oh, let's just keep this ink and then use it for something somehow. Uh, what, what do well, you think? Typically, I've about seen stuff like this was so it's typically looking gaudy, which it does. <laughs> Well, so typically squid ink that I've seen, it comes in the jars and then it's like you put like a little spoonful in like a batch and that colors the whole thing because it's very potent. Sort of like what I say with saffron where it's like you can get like a tin of saffron, but you throw in like a few strands and it colors a big batch of rice like you don't use it for that much. Um, but I'd imagine this stuff doesn't keep super long. So it's probably one of these things where if you get squid ink in, you probably just like run this as a special or maybe do like – a squid ink pasta, maybe do like um, I've seen sauces. I think they're in seasonal. There was a pres, there was an item that had um, squid ink in the like a puree. So like you find ways to use it up because it's like it usually comes in jars and like I say it doesn't keep, but you don't need that much of it either. So it's like you probably try and use it as much as you can. And my guess is this was probably a special. They probably ran it and they probably it's like everybody pushed this and people see it. Oh, that looks cool. I'll order that and that's how you use all of it up. Um, as far as calamari, I don't know how they got it in. Uh, specifically, I've seen places that actually get like the whole squid in though. Like um, they, they actually come in buckets, like with starfish and things still in the buckets and they pull them out. Then it's like, you have to, uh, you know, cut open the head, pull out the beak, cut the head up into rings, pull apart the tentacles, all that. Um, I didn't see what they did here, but again, I didn't work in the kitchen, so I didn't really look out for that either way. Okay. Yeah. I'd, I'd imagine that a place says, as as quality as uh, as as Felidia, they would actually be making their own. Um, yeah. I mean, doing their own, like breaking down their own. Like, cause I've I've broken down squid a couple of times myself, and yeah, when you get it yourself, you can cut you can cut it to the sizes and things that you want. And yeah, that's definitely a suggestion for those of y'all that have broken down more regular types of animals. Definitely try to break down the squid, and you can really realize just how different earthlings could be. <laughs> it's like a completely alien. It's got this little like plasticky type of thing, like the the it's it's an invert. No, it's not. It's, okay, the invert is this there's this weird plasticky thing. It's a, it's just it's a crazy it's, creature. That's, that's the beak. <laughs> that's the beak. It's called. It's actually a cartilage in the middle. You have to pull it out. Yeah. Hmm. No, no, the, the beak is the beak. The beak is like yeah. right in the mouth. It's like really sharp. Yeah. There's something in the actual, you know, in that uh, cylindrical area, the, the head type of place that keeps it. It looks like almost like a flipper, but it's like inside. Yeah. It's really thin. I, I'll, 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 try, I'll try to remember to put the, the images of me breaking down the squid on, on the screen. It's, it's strange it's a animal. <laughs> yeah. And I, I just typed in on the image.
search was like black ink risotto and calamari. It seems to be somewhat there's a lot of different options. Someone here with like a monster claw on it. I saw a few different places have have done it, but it it, it makes sense. But it also lends itself as we were talking about in the first part with like the different things, the risotto, with it being rice. It's more a way to prepare things. And now if you have this idea of something that can actually color the things, I'm sure there's also different kind of things like in the previous one. I think we talked about. Uh, and um, in the series, we were talking about uh, uh, Casalula. We also got into how like the beets are used for coloring. So I can imagine there might be some beet risotto or some. So it, whatever you have, where you can put a lot of color into the actual infuse the risotto itself with color. I'm sure there's different ones finding ways to do like a greener risotto. So I can imagine it's something that's a, it's a typically done thing. Yeah, there's there's beet risotto and um, there, I think I think it was yeah because remember that was in the uh, seasonal presentation with the duck the beets and uh, cherry juice and the beets so it's this deep red color and that one no it was uh, sorry it was farro cooked with um, beets and uh, cherry juice so it has that like similar color but I've seen beet risotto as well and I think um, there's also I've seen uh, I think Barbalut it was actually had carrot risotto so it's like a deep orange color I mean there's a, there's a lot of Ooh. stuff you can do I mean yeah yeah, yeah. so any of y'all listening. Uh, let let us know if you've had other kinds of risotto or different kinds of uh, yeah. distinct coloring. Let us know how, how yeah. it tasted. Yeah. yeah. So anything else? I mean, now what was the price on something? You said you were it wasn't there, but would no. What would the price on something like this be? That's a good question. Exactly. Um, my stance on gold on food is that it's kind of tacky and it's more about image and it's like you know these places will put gold stuff on something and charge more money. Like there was that gold pizza that has the gold uh, paper on it. I'm just like. A hundred bucks for that. I'd rather go and get like a decent meal somewhere. I don't know. Um, but I mean, they put it if if they put it on and they sell. I mean, here I don't think it's much because there's a spray you can buy that like it just like lightly coats it. So I don't think it's that much, but it just makes it look like look fancier than it is. So I'm not sure how much this went for. Um, my guess is probably like, I mean, I don't know because I've seen risottos for like. 15 20 bucks if it's like vegetable and maybe if there's meat or something nicer it's 40 plus um maybe 50 60 at most if there's some like nice stuff and i don't know it probably i'd guess probably somewhere in like 40 dollar range or something yeah right. be my guess be yeah. my guess i'm not sure yeah. yeah okay well yeah so that was that was it for for that i think now we can jump to the next one yeah and here we have some main sea scallops uh satimboka which is with speck and sage and cauliflower spinach. This is a nice plate in here. Yeah, this was very nice. This was on the lunch menu, I want to say. So salt in bocca, for those who don't know, means uh, jumps in mouth in the mouth in Italian. Um, originally, it's either a chicken or a veal cutlet wrapped with prosciutto, and there's usually sage in between the prosciutto and the meat, so it takes on that flavor. Now, what Chef Fortunato did here was instead of um, – Chicken or pork, chicken or pork or veal. He used uh, scallops, and instead of prosciutto, he used speck, which is a cured Germanic meat. It's popular in Austria, Germany, but also Alto Adige in northern Italy. And there's there was some sage in between the scallop and the speck, of course. And then cauliflower here is kind of two ways, because you can see here there's a green and yellow roasted cauliflower. Sometimes the blue as well. There's a tricolor, but I guess this one didn't have it. And um, there's a cauliflower puree. That's what the white is. And then there's some sautéed spinach with some garlic. You can see the little uh, white bits. Yeah, really nice dish, though. Uh. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's it just it, it looks really appealing just from the, uh, from yeah. the images and. Uh... So the blue cauliflower is actually blue, or because I hadn't really heard about that before. I'm seeing, I'm looking at some images here, and they're showing some that are actually blue. And I don't know if this is like just the white one dyed, or is it actually no, just no, that, it, it's actually that color. Blue. It's actually that color. I've had them in places I've worked. Uh -huh. Yeah. Cool. Yes, yeah, so we'll have it, that on the screen. Um, it's it's sort of like the different uh, corn varieties that you see in Mexico, though, where it's like they don't really taste different. It's more presentation. Like, if you know, you can see those. They used to call yeah. them Indian corn, but I guess you're not supposed to say that now. But, I mean, if you look at, like, they have, like, a red corn, a yellow corn, a blue corn. But if you taste them side by side, they don't. it's not really different. It's more presentation. And with cauliflower, it's a similar story. So it's more – if you had all these on the plate, they would, they would taste the same, but it just looks cool. Instead of just white cauliflower, you see the different colors. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I think from the look of this, I I don't think the blue would be a positive add to this dish because it's kind of got those earthier colors. The blue, I mean, would just it, uh, I like how kind of the the warmish colors that that are going. Here. Blue is more bringing like a colder color. This is from my <laughs> graphic design like art background. 
I think visually this 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 looks really good. Uh, I again, and then of course I don't know how how much the blue color would still be maintained after being grilled or or roasted like the the cauliflower here is. Well, that's the thing. When when the cauliflower is um, raw, I want to say it's more of a purplish, and it actually turns bluish when you cook it. So you can okay. do. I've seen. I've, I've actually seen purple cauliflower puree. I'm trying to remember. There, they, we had a dish here that had that on it. I'm trying to remember if I included it in here. I may not have, but um, the color does change a little. That's sort of the issue. Um, but you know, if you want that on the plate, like, but that, but that's again, that's one of those things that people either think it's cool or think it's weird. So depending on who you're catering to, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, see here the the purple, and um, I'll have that on the screen right now. It's one uh, version with a um, a green and very green, and then a yellowish one, and then you have here the what's it called the purple one. Yeah, all right. Unusual seeds from your flower vegetable garden. Okay, so yeah, that's that's cool. And, yeah, and again, this is just switching out to different things. So the salted vodka is just like a it's it's a technique of something that's made in a certain way. It's like the same way with the risotto. You can switch out the ingredients with different kinds of things as been done here. It's like the main sea scallops and then bringing in things from different locations because you have the general idea of it. And that's the key thing. You don't have to... I think something that keeps people back from actually cooking is they think it has to be exact. There's no like exact science. Like culinary arts is an arts about it. I think it's a part of expressing yeah. uh, different taste buds react to things in different ways. As I mentioned, you might be living in a certain location, but if you understand this part of the meal is supposed to accomplish this kind of mouthfeel or this kind of support system or provide a protein, do this kind of thing in the entire dish, once you know that, you can start swapping those things out with different things to come up with very exciting different combinations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thought I thought it was interesting because, like, like I say, it's typically one of those meats I mentioned, but it it works well with the scallop because the scallop it's it's delicate, but at the same time the speck is not so overwhelming because it's a little smoky. So that and the sage, it all sort of works well together. And whereas if you were to take, I think, like an ultra white fish, it would be so lean, and I think it would, the flavor would be too muted. But scallops have enough fat content and everything that it works well together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now we well, shall jump on to the next one and talk about the fishes. We're still on some seafood. Yeah, and we've mentioned this before. Italy, of course, has is a lot of coast. <laughs> yeah. Italy, a lot of coast, a lot of rivers. So there's a lot of seafood, a lot of uh, fish and things like that uh, in the in the actual uh, Italian Italian inspired or based dishes. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I thought was funny with seasonal. When I saw all these fish dishes, I was like, "Wait, Austria is a landlocked country." And I said, "Do you guys <laughs> eat, do you guys eat much fish?" And he said, "I mean, obviously they import them now, but historically they mostly ate trout and other lake fish. I mean, there wasn't much beyond that." Yeah. 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 All right. So here we go with the uh, salmon with mustard sauce, mashed potatoes, and spinach. Yeah, this was interesting. This was on the lunch menu as well. Um, I'm not crazy about cooked salmon, but I actually kind of like this dish. I think the way the salmon was sort of um, the brown on the outside, it was kind of crispy. The mustard sauce was nice. It's whole grain mustard, kind of sweet. And then the mashed potatoes were interesting because she actually put uh, corn and spinach inside of them, which I don't typically see. This is more, I'm not going to say quite like smashed potatoes, but if you notice the texture here, it's a little coarser. So the fat content yeah. in this is a little lower. Whereas if the French ones that I've had uh, at other places, the, like the butter to potato ratio is practically one to one. Like <laughs> it's so it's so smooth. They put so much in. Uh, we we can maybe touch on it in a future presentation. But I went to Mineta recently and I tried the potatoes ali goat, which are um they're like mashed potatoes, but there's a lot of cheese in them instead. So you pull them apart. They're actually kind of stringy. It's really interesting. Um, I tried those recently, but this by the texture of it, because it looks a little coarser, I think it's leaner. A general rule is when you make purees and things like this, if it's coarser, it's probably leaner. Whereas you add more butter, like it gets smoother. Um, but that again depends on what you're trying to do. Texture wise, uh, the French, the French, of course, would dump a ton of butter and everything. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, which is technically not always a bad thing, but no, uh, I've recently become become rather partial to switching things out with like the coconut equivalent of it. So if it's like something needs milk, I switch out coconut milk. Something needs cream, I switch out coconut cream. If something needs oil, I switch out coconut oil. So that's something that I've been I've been attempting some of these things, and it's it's, it's I, I've been enjoying it as as a substitute to butter or, or ghee that, that in in different diets and things like that when it comes to the oils. So I'm wondering, yeah, that would be kind of an interesting. Thing. I'm trying to think. Um, I prefer, yeah, I prefer putting stuff in my mashed potatoes. Um, it's something that 
that it's like another one of those things where people are just like, okay, we just want to have this plain mashed potatoes. And like, there's so many different things you can do just by yeah. adding like some spices into it and change the color a bit, you know, just add some herbs while you're doing it. So there's many other things you can do. So I'm not trying to think what a good combination to go with like some uh, coconut cream would be. Maybe like coconut cream and raisins to do more of a more like savory, like sweeter type of mashed potatoes might be something that I can think of doing. It's like the cardamoms or something. Yeah, that could be something that I think I'll, I'll just kind of note and do it. But you were talking about the salmon. Like, would you like the salmon raw, like raw, like more of like a yeah. kudo type of thing? Or it's like, okay. I, I typically like salmon either smoked or raw. So I either like it in the form of, well, smoked like on a sandwich or with like, you know, cream cheese and bagels. I like salmon sushi. I like um, salmon carpaccio, as you're sort of getting at. Salmon crudo tartare. I mean, crudo carpaccio tartare, like crudo, it's usually sliced. Um, carpaccio pounded out flat. Tartare is cut into tiny pieces. I've had different versions of that. All works really well. I just I just think when it's raw, it has that much more mild, delicate flavor. I don't like the ultra fishy, well-cooked flavor. Like, I remember... When I was home, I told my dad that and he got a little offended because he was making salmon. I told him I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, I told him I'm like, look, if you make it, I'll eat it. But it's like I'm not going to go to a restaurant and get seared salmon. It's just I don't know. It, it gets too fishy for me or something. The flavor just it, it's not really my thing. Yeah. I don't mind the, the, the fishing. It's like, yeah, this, and this is my go-to way. Like you yeah. sear it and then you you bake it in the oven for some time until it gets yeah. like nice and flaky and things like that. And yeah, it looks like a nice cut there. Um, one other thing with the sound, what else was I thinking? I, oh, yeah, I did these, uh, what's it called? I did some, uh, it was some time back. I haven't, I haven't done them in, in some time. Where you get the smoked salmon, and then they did some, um, some smoked salmon, like, sushi rolls with cucumber on the outside, like the salmon cream cheese on the inside. It was, it was really good. Yeah. It's something I've tried in that kind of way. Um, I'm forgetting what they're actually called, but... Um, I'll, I'll try to remember put them on the screen. But yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. So anything else? Are those like little mustard seeds in the mustard? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's uh, whole grain. It's whole grain. It's, it's whole grain mustard in the sauce. So you see the actual seeds rather than um, like Dijon or something, which is pureed smooth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking something like this. You can maybe add like some caviar or some little like little seedy type of things in there. But yeah, it's it looks good. And did they have any other? mashed potato uh, mixes besides this corn and spinach here, if this is the, the typical one that they do. Yeah, I want to say that there were some more standard pump puree on the menu where it was made more of like the French style. Um, I don't remember which dishes exactly, but I'm pretty sure they did serve that at some point. Yeah. Okay. So pump puree. And yep. that's, as you mentioned, that's slightly different. It's more mashed smashed than the... Yeah. Pure, and yeah, so they call it puree, but it's mashed. Uh, anyway, uh, well, it's, it's well, the way you, the way you're supposed to make it, and it's funny because I actually learned this from my mother growing up, is you use a food mill. But what they do is, if you, I actually have, maybe we can talk about it in a future presentation. But I have uh, Joël Robuchon's cookbook here. He was one of the French masters. I think he had like the most Michelin stars in the world. Like I think he had almost thirty or something. And yeah. he actually was famous for his pump puree dish, and he had it down to a science where. He used fingerling potatoes and he would cook them with the skins on, peel them off. And it, what he would do is he would actually adjust the fat content based on the time of year. Because I think it's when it, I think when they get colder, there's more starch. And when it's warmer, there's less starch or something. So he would adjust it accordingly. And what you do is you peel the potatoes with the skin. You cook them with the skin on. It retains the flavor. Peel the skin off. Run it through the food mill. You add the butter as you're pureeing it. And then he pushes it through the tammy, the fine mesh sieve. So it's like super smooth. And that's one of the things that the new cooks in his restaurants actually have to do is um, you have to make like a perfect pump, uh, pump puree regularly before you can advance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's good. I, but, but then again, we're talking about that. I'm just thinking personally like puree. I think about something smoother. But then yeah. now when I think about it, a lot of people like their mashed potatoes rather chunky, like with actual yeah. chunks of it. So so yeah. I could just be the one who's using my own bias to to go to one side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the next one here we have is a venison shop with a Negroni puree, uh, salsify, and Brussels sprouts. Sure. So I thought this was a very interesting um this was a very interesting preparation. Uh, Negroni, if you, for those who don't know, it's a cocktail. It's made from gin, uh, vermo uh, vermouth rosso. That's a red vermouth and Campari. Um, the, the menu, the bar menu here typically had about four Negronis on it. I can send you a picture. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if um, 
I don't think I sent it to you, but typically we had about four or so different Negronis on the menu. There was like a white Negroni. I, at one point we had a squash Negroni. We had a beet Negroni and there was one other. Um, so, you know, the idea was they would change based on the season what was available. So the chef here actually decided to make a sauce based on the cocktail itself. A salsa fee, for those who don't know, it's a white vegetable. It's um, It has a black root. The German name, I mentioned in the seasonal presentation, Schwarz votes on black root because it's actually a black root but white inside. Um, milder, you typically cook it in milk. You can do different preparations. Brussels sprouts, self-explanatory, and then the chop with the bone on here. So it just kind of rests on the plate. It's really, really nice dish. I mean, I like venison a lot, and it's in season this time of year. So it's a cool dish. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm seeing from the plate here, the salsa is better be behind, somewhat behind. You can see it peeking out from the back of the chop there. Yeah. And uh, the plate thing has a bit of an Italian flag type of thing. Uh -huh. with the green and the, the white plate in the middle and then the red of the side. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that it, that... Um, it's... I don't know that that was deliberate, though, or he just liked the way it looked. I think it might have... It could have I mean, maybe it was. I'm not sure. Huh. Yeah. I mean, it does. It does look good. I mean, it looks good. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Venison is now venison. Um, hmm. Is venison? Wait. Can this venison? Is venison deer? Well, yeah, so we typically use it to refer to deer, but broadly it's that category. So like elk or caribou would be called venison on the menu too. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was thinking. But, yeah. But a lot, okay, so a lot of people, a lot of people, well, well uh, this is deer, but I, what I was about to say is a lot of people will specify those. So if they have elk, they'll say this is elk. But I think venison can broadly refer to anything in that category. Yeah. Now, at a, at a restaurant like, um, like Felidia, would you be getting this from farm, from a farm, or this is like wild caught? Would they just have certain hunters that, that do the wild caught one? That's a good question, actually. I never asked. I, for, for different restaurants, it depends on the place, because I know... I think a lot of places get it from farms because I know there's rules about if they're caught in the wild, then could they potentially have diseases or other things? And I, I mean, yeah. I'd imagine I'd imagine there's certain like like I know there's some certain gun clubs near um, like where I'm from that are actually fairly prestigious. Like um, Don Trump Jr. actually hunts at a gun club near where I'm from. So I, I'd imagine in places like that, they probably monitor them to make sure like, you know, the health is good and everything. But. If if it just like like I don't think someone can go out shoot a deer and bring it into the restaurant like they wouldn't allow that because it would go against too many <laughs> yeah. regulations. Yeah. 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 So I was listening to, listen to the No Agenda show and um, they were talking about this place where one one of the hosts lives in in uh, Texas and he was talking about some kind of I'm forgetting the animal he was saying. Uh, it's like kudzu or something like it's some kind of animal that that's that's indigenous to Africa some, to sub-Saharan Africa. But there's this ranch, this massive ranch in Texas where you can go and pay th up to thousands of dollars to hunt all wide range of different like hooved animals and and they just like stock them there in this massive like hundreds of acres place and then you go there and you're like yeah I want to I want to hunt a water buffalo they get like multiple kinds of water buffaloes wow. it's like if you want to hunt a water buffalo you pay them something like twenty thousand dollars and it's a guarantee they say okay we'll guarantee you actually because we know this wow. we know we have 50 of these animals so we'll track you you go out there you get it and then they have somebody who uh chops it down for you breaks it down gives you whatever meat you want and then i guess the rest of wow. it they, they go into market and things like that but it's just an interesting kind of idea of things and it's some of the things that i thought of like most of the animals that have been involved in like <laughs> being food for humans in in a farming kind of sense have proliferated Yes, you can talk about like people saying oh, we're overfishing certain places, but I think that's in part due to the fact that uh, the ownership and maintenance of actual certain locations, but the farmed fish are doing pretty well. Like the ones yeah. in the ocean might be mistreated, and that's more, I think, due to negative, um, so central plan kind of ideas. Like, oh, we can have these borders here. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's something. I, I personally think they should be allowing, allowed humans, private parties to go out there and just have their own schooners out there and just shoot down people. Uh, <laughs> shoot down well, people overfishing. Uh, well, because well, in regards to the gun club too, they own this like pretty big area. So even the yeah. woods are sort of cordoned off. Like there are signs saying like, no trespassing, this is private property. It's a felony if you trespass. So because of that, the deer can proliferate in that area. And then when you hunt them, I think there's certain rules about like, you can only get one or two. You can't just like, you couldn't just go through and shoot up all these random deer. There'd be rules about like, you're allowed to take one or two or whatever it is. So because of that, they're mostly protected. I mean, obviously they're there to be hunted, but at the same time, it's like, 
anyone can't just walk in and shoot random deer for fun. So like that's sort of reinforcing what you're saying because they enforce that property. And I'd have to look up how big this place is, but I remember like I would go for my long walks and like this whole area, they would say, this is property of the gun club. So it must've gone for miles. So if, you know, if that area is kept safe, I mean, you know, the deer can deer breed like crazy anyway. So <laughs> there's no worry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Uh, did you have, was this there when you, when you were there? Yes, yeah, so I got I got I got to try this dish. It was very nice. Yeah. What's your general take of venison for people that have it? Had like I'm not too good at explaining some of these things, but what's if somebody has never had it and has had beef or uh, mutton, what what would you kind of explain the taste was? So people always describe these meats as being gamey. I'm trying to think of how to put that into words. Um, it's yeah. almost <laughs> like a it's it's almost like sort of. I don't know if it's a higher iron content. There's something, there's a different flavor profile. Like if you had this next to beef and pork, you could tell it right away. Typically, I like venison more medium rare or medium because it's like, like I've said before with duck, like duck has a lot of iron as well. And if you cook duck well, it just tastes like metal. Um, but so, but I think it's a similar thing with venison because I remember as a kid, my parents used to get it from our neighbor and they'd cook the hell out of it. And I didn't like it because it just tasted like pure game. But if you have a chop where it's, you know, nice sear on the outside, then you cut into it very very mild in the middle, um, definitely lower in fat content. Obviously, deer is a leaner animal. Um, typically, you eat the chop. I, I haven't seen a whole lot else served. I mean, I'm sure you could do like braise the other parts and everything. Like, I mean, if you were to it's braise serious. a deer leg, you, you could, yeah, you could braise the leg. I mean, it wouldn't be a ton of meat, but you, but you know, if it, you cooked it down a lot, I'm sure it'd be probably very good for you. I mean, very lean, nutrient rich. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so some of y'all out there, I'm sure there's going to be chances are there's going to be somebody who's hunted before. What else do y'all normally do with like the deer meat? The people get their whole animal and break it down. What what's your uh, chosen and preferred dishes to make with the other parts besides like these meatier parts that we can, of course, can roast this way or just do like uh, some stews? And yeah, let, let us know. Oh. I was gonna say I've had uh, I've had venison sausage. I think it was from D'Artagnan. I think I posted it before on my page. And the thing with venison sausage is you typically have to add pork fat or something else to it because you think about it when you make sausage you add fat to it, but deer don't have yeah. much fat. And there's something too with deer about when they die they have to be bled out quickly because they go rancid quick like really fast. Um, so I think what it is is you kill the deer they have they cut up the meat, but then they mix it with pork spices other things. And I think that's a sausage. So you know for our Kosher and halal friends, I don't think you can have venison sausage unless there's some substitute fat you can put in, I think. Uh, yeah, they can uh, probably find uh, some beef or some 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 way. There, there's probably I'm ways sure, to yeah. these things. Or if yeah, not, yeah. You, maybe you're listening for the first time, you could be someone who starts that company and you can uh, you can provide for them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. So now on to the next one here. We have a uh, chicken pizzaiola. Sure. So I think I think you could probably tell by the name. It's a uh, this was on the lunch menu as well. Chicken cutlet, uh, tomato sauce, um, just some mozzarella over top, sautéed spinach underneath. I'm trying to remember which vegetable was was served here too. If it was cauliflower or what? Just like you know, it's it's a little reminiscent of chicken parmesan, but I guess this is like the pure, like more Italian form. Um, you know, popular lunchtime item, a little more casual, but I mean, definitely a crowd pleaser. Not a whole lot to say on this one. I mean, I think it's you know a nice item that. It's one of those things that if you put if you put this on the menu, people will definitely order it. Yeah. But this is also a good example of um, how Stephen had mentioned this before. Certain cuisines or certain places will have a different kind of culture in eating. From my experience, when you go to the real authentic like Italian places, it, dinner is normally take some time. It's an extended kind of thing. It's like five courses because in a situation where somebody thinks chicken parm they would think chicken parm with like linguine. They'll think about the pasta that goes with it. But in Italy, the way it's traditionally served, it's like, no, it's just, this is the meat. This is the meat part. This is the carne part of the of the of your, your dinner. And then you would have the salata, which is just the salad by itself. Then you have like a pasta dish that is primarily pasta. And that's why you'll have like a, like a pasta pomodoro, like a pasta, on the, but like, it's like just pasta with like spices. Like that would pretty much be it, or spices and some sauce. It's not like pasta with like meat and mushrooms and all kinds of things in it. Those are more, um, I don't wanna say they're more Americanized dishes, but you have this whole idea where it's like, the, the, the meals are kind of broken down. So you're focusing, the highlight of this is the, is the chicken itself. That's what's being augmented by the, I means being garnished by the, by the veg that's here. It's being augmented by the cheese and the sauce is supposed to be primarily to taste that chicken with it, not like with the pasta and all these other things. Because that's why it is, we talked about it's like over 350 different kinds of pasta. Because those different pastas are supposed to also have their own highlights and their own purposes and their own uh, starring in their own particular dishes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, I didn't have much else to say on that. I didn't know if you had any questions or anything. Okay. Yeah. Now, so with the potato, do they do this with any other kinds of, because uh, now mozzarella has its own unique kind of melting style. So if they do this with any other kind of, um, with stuff like this now, in my experience, there's very few chicken dishes actually in Italian cuisine from the different places I was in. And there's a yeah. lot of beef, a lot of uh, the lamb is there, most definitely a whole lot of pork. I think there's more pork than there is beef and um, in the seafood, as you mentioned. But chicken was very, it was very uncommon. Now, this was mostly in the Roman area. I didn't really go out too much to restaurants when I was living in Turin. So there might be certain regions that have more chicken. But from my experience, chicken is very uncommonly used. Like the typical chicken dish you'll just find is some simple lemon chicken, which is more like a grilled thing, just with some lemon on it and some maybe black peppers on top of it. That was a typical thing if you like chicken. And it would literally, like, you would go to the, diet, to the venue and they'd be like, 10 different kinds of pork versions, like 10 different kinds of pork options, <laughs> like five or six different kinds of beef options. And it's like chicken, like, like chicken Le Monde. That was it. <laughs> so is, is that something you notice as well? That's a good question. Cause like I said, this restaurant feature dish is mostly from Sicily, Friuli and um, Piedmont. So I'm what, like, I'd like to delve more into this region by region. Cause I know broadly speaking, we tend to think of the North being more risotto and cured meats. South is more, tomato based stuff and pastas and then sicily of course we have seafood um i'm not but able but as i've also said before too this stuff has shifted over time because i mean people traveling back and forth people exchange ideas so yeah like like you say i mean there aren't a lot of chicken dishes but i don't know if there's some historical reason for that or if it's just they prefer the other meats or i don't know because I, I was just thinking to myself like this dish you couldn't even you couldn't even do this dish as a kosher style because in kosher cooking you're not supposed to cook meat with dairy so it's like you can't do melted cheese over meat um but that but then i'm wondering like i know i mean i know there are a lot of jews in italy too in certain areas but um but like you said they eat a lot of pork i mean there's a ton of cured pork items so yeah i'm not 100 percent sure i mean maybe maybe i guess they were wealthy enough that they could afford more pigs and cows over chickens so they eat more i don't know i mean i'm not about be curious to look into that though now that you mention it yeah yeah we might look yeah. into it or some of y'all listening out there they might know yeah. probably if you're listening to this long enough we've, we've looked into it we've done a different series where we've talked about that more yeah. but yeah let us know in the comment section if, if it's something that you've either noticed or yeah. know why it's actually a thing or tell us that it's actually not true and yeah. for some reason i'm just picking it out more in italian food but yeah okay so moving on to the next one here and we have some yeah. veal medallions with uh castelmagno fonduta yeah, this was a very nice dish. This was on the dinner menu and occasionally got um, reinterpreted uh, different ways. Typically veal medallions, but there were different roasted vegetables that would go in between. Uh, the fall, it was squash. Um, when artichokes were in season, it was artichokes. Uh, springtime, it was more green vegetables, usually roasted, put in the middle. And then there was the fonduta on top. That's this cheese here, the castel magno. Um, typically, it was hazelnuts on top, but here he did walnuts, so I guess I tweaked a little trying to remember what the puree on the bottom was this recipe is in the cookbook but it was this particular mm -hmm. version of that you see pictured here um but you know you could you could change or definitely different root vegetables pureed on the bottom or um you could even swap out the cheese but melts well and different nuts like i say um typically it was hazelnuts when i was there though so uh th this was always a very popular dish this is probably probably one of, i think this dish actually sold the most out of all the entrees uh. oh, nice but yeah, again, again, you can see it's it's highlighting the real here. I I, yeah. I like that about Italian food, but yeah, good. yeah. of course, time wise, people are going to have different months of time to have different things. But it's yeah. for especially for people who are doing like more like restrictive diets, like keto and things like that. I think or where they're like, okay, we we're cutting a certain thing out of our diet, things like that. Yeah, I think it, Italian. Italian inspired dishes is a lot of really good things for that because you can focus on okay I need to focus on this vegetable that is giving me this many this many carbs or this many things yeah. so how can I do something with just that yeah I think it's it's a good kind of uh, cuisine to look at for things like that yeah and then like I say too like I say too the general idea but you can tweak it based on the season so do like mm -hmm. um we were talking about delicata squash a nice one with like the stripes on it you could do that this time of year you could do you know you could do acorn squash, you could do butternut squash, you could do something with pumpkin even, you want to get creative. And then, like I say, spring comes, I mean, maybe do ramps, do, you know, spring peas. Like, you know, you can take, the basic dish works well with a lot of things, just tweak based on what's available and what's in season. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what do you think was was really appealing about this? Why do you think it, it was one of the best sellers? 
I mean, I think I think veal medallion. So you figure medallions. That's uh, if you picture picture the tenderloin where filet mignon comes from. Um, that's cut from that. Typically with filet mignon, because the tenderloin's thicker. What it is is the thick part at the end is chateau briand. The narrow part at the end that usually gets cut cut up into medallions. But because the veal is a smaller animal, I think you just cut all the way through. So it, it's like. Filet mignon, I would say probably even more tender. So you typically would get that medium rare, super easy to cut. Uh, people, of course, love cheese, as you know we frequently yeah. talk about uh, <laughs> the cheese sauce, and um, you know it's nice with the nuts on it. You, I think you could do it without the nuts too. The nuts aren't in it; they're just sprinkled on top. And you know, roasted vegetables usually nice too. I mean, I, I like roasted vegetables as well, especially ones like I say squash or whatever that has more sugar because it really accentuates those flavors. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, sounds good. And yeah. this was this one of the older dishes as well. Far as I know, yeah, because we 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 um we were sitting at one of our pre shift meetings and we actually broke it down like it was towards the end of the year like which dishes sold the most and which sold the least and that had to do with decisions as far as what's staying on the menu versus what's coming off and they said this sold like the most out of all the entrees so it it was always on. Yeah. Did it get shifted over to Babo as well? Is it like a equivalent there? That's a good question, actually. I didn't look for it, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't be terribly surprised. I mean, I'm sure. You know, I'm sure if it did well. I know. I noticed a lot of the pastas right away, including some of the ones we discussed last time. But uh, it would make sense. I know. I think there was a car. There was a beef carpaccio. I don't think we talked about it in here, but I think I remember that from Felidia. That went to Babo, so it wouldn't surprise me that much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. So here we go with a rather exciting little plate. Oh, it's not, it's a, I guess it's a decent sized plate. I can't really kind of say, okay, there's a fork and knife. Yes, it's, 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 a, it's a decent sized plate, but um, it's yeah. an interesting plate in here. Very colorful, jumping off of the of the thing. And this is a canolo aperto, which is an open yep. cannoli. And yep. uh, tell us a bit about this. This is one featuring blood orange sauce with candied citrus. Sure. So this this is another staple that was on the menu uh, on the dessert. So open cannoli. So it's the cannoli uh, pastry, but it's cut into squares instead of rolled up. Uh, the filling goes in between the different layers. Um, this this was like sort of like I described with the veal. It was the basic comp the basic. Uh, components stayed year round but then the garnish would change depending on what was in season so i think it always had the pistachio remember again chef fortunata from sicily so he liked pistachios on a lot mm -hmm. of things um blood orange of course that's a sicilian thing as well uh this also has uh kumquats you can probably tell by the shape two types of candied citrus actually actually wait it's um kumquats there's some pineapple on the left side that was a candied pineapple really good candied orange zest on top uh, a little cocoa shaved over top Blood orange. I'm not sure what the cream is. I'm trying to remember. There's like that yellowish cream. I know the uh, the red is the blood orange, but I'm trying to remember what the yellow was. But like I said, I mean, it may change year by year. So, but uh, sorry, season by season. So, um, you know, this time of year would probably be something with apples. Uh, I think this might have been winter because citrus is actually a winter item. Um, in the spring, maybe you have like berries or something, you know. But uh, this this is another one of those dishes like. It sells well because you tell people like, oh, if you like cannoli, you'll like this. It's the components, but we added a bunch of things and re restructured it. And people think, oh, this is really cool. And this was on the lunch and dinner menu. Always sold, always very popular. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see why. And as yeah. as um, uh, it's, you know, as as I mentioned, I could have a bias with this, but from my experience, there wasn't too many uh, interesting uh, desserts when it comes to Italian food. There's, of course, like tiramisu is the one that's it's most well known, and of course gelato, which is it, it is something different about gelato than ice cream. I find I find it's kind of like in the middle between like your typical American style ice cream and like uh, the frozen yogurt. There's there's something more airy and and fluffier about the gelato, it's smoother. I, I I really like it. And in, in Rome, I got there, there were so many different kinds of flavors, like coconut, like rice, like all sorts of different kinds of things they can do with that gelato preparation. So those are two staples. And when you have those two, it's kind of a tiramisu is amazing. And you have that, those are great things to have. So I guess you don't really need to do that much, but we switched over into the desserts on this, on this, um, on this discussion now. And <laughs> there's still a lot more to go in the document. And sometimes with these ones, I haven't looked look through before, but I've edited these on these images, and there's a lot of interesting th things here. So with this one, um, the first of the desserts here, can you tell us what is, what's the thinking or the kind of kitchen cooking industry type of, um, type of definition or idea? What qualifies as this open? Because I've seen this in several different places now. It's been something that, that's come up in a, a lot of these talks where they say open this, open that. What does that necessarily refer to? 
Um, well, it's it's just because typically cannoli because it's rolled up, whereas this it's the layers, but it's like it's all exposed. I mean, that's all I can get from it. I don't know unless there's some other. Yeah. So it's going to apply to things like burritos or like pies or things like that. You can't really like open a dish that's like already technically kind of sort of open. Well, it's well, kind of well, about things that are wrapped. Yeah. Well, because like if you take like the like if you take like the tartatin, it looks like a pie, but it's it had the way you make it is that. You cook the vet. You cook the fruit in a pot on the stove. Put it into the pie. Um, you put it into the pie uh, tin. But then what it is, you put the crust on top. But then when you serve it, you flip it over so that fruit is exposed. So that's kind of like a. I guess that's kind of like an open pie, but like it. It's called something else because the Tatin sisters invented it in Paris, and there's a whole story behind it. So I, I, I think it's sort of if you want to draw that line of like. They did this and they renamed it something else, or we just took the same components and just call it open. I guess it's you know depending on what they wanted to do. I mean, I guess I guess like you could do an open burrito or something. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I never really gave it much thought. I suppose. Yep. Yeah, well, it's like a taco ball. Anyway, okay. So uh, now with this one, um, with candied stuff, that is that's that's when it's with a simple syrup or put the sugar, then it's roasted. The fruits are roasted after they've been put in the syrup. Or can you just do it like grilled? Like, how do you candy things? Like, what's the typical kind of idea behind that? Uh, it depends on what it is. I mean, for this, I think this was just uh, simple syrup. Like, for example, the um, the kumquats. It's just actually, for those who don't know, the kumquats is actually the outside that's sweeter and the inside that's tart, which is the opposite of most citrus. Usually, it's the skin is sour and the inside is sweet. Um, so it looked like they just took the insides here and probably simmer them. It looks like the middle part sort of fell out, so these are probably really sweet. The pineapple looks like it was just cut into very small pieces and it probably gently simmered. Um, candied zest, you can make it different ways. Like I know some people will actually, what you can do is like when we did it at seasonal, you actually cut out the white, the pith, the pith I think it's called, um, because the white makes it like really uh, bitter. So if you had just have the yellow, it's it gets rid of that. Um, what you can do is you can either cut out the white and just candy it once and it's sweet. Or what I've seen too is people will actually take the whole peel, including the white, but they'll candy it like three times or something. And that actually <laughs> the sugar will, well, the sugar will actually penetrate enough that it's not sour at all. But um, like you can do that with grapefruit peel because grapefruit, of course, the peel is super sour, as you can imagine. Um, but it's a question of like what your preparation is, what, the, what, uh, what the size you want and all that. Like I know um, the German bread stolen, we had that at Les Bollier where I did my externship. That's pretty involved because you have to make like, it's like candied lemon, orange, um, I think it may be lime peel or something, but there's like a few different candied citrus peels. And you have to, you have to do that where you candy each one multiple times and then you put it into the dough. So it's a pretty involved process to make the bread. Yeah. Huh. That's, that's, yeah, that's, um, is this is kind of one of the things where those those are some of the things that I think of when I'm actually making when I'm ordering something outside. It's like if I'm going to make it by myself, like chances are I'm not going to make it. So if I saw a dessert like this, I'm like yeah, chances of me making all the parts for this dessert <laughs> like slim yeah. to none. So like this is something most definitely that I'd order even without uh, seeing this really appealing uh, plate that you have here. And we've talked about blood orange before. If you've never had blood yeah. orange, most definitely try to have it. Yeah. As I I like to describe it that it's. It's what pink lemonade is supposed to taste like, uh -huh. the artificial thing that you think pink lemonade is. And of course, pineapples is one of my favorite little things here. You should also check and see, I think I might put on the screen how a pineapple fruit actually grows, because it's it's rather, it's rather, um, it's if you haven't seen a pineapple fruit, you probably don't know how it grows. Mm -mm. But when you see how it grows, you kind of, it's kind of like, yeah, that's, of course, that's how it grows. Like, there would be no other kind of way that a pineapple would grow than what it actually looks like. It's one of those things. But also, like, in general, it's normally included in citrus. And I was wondering, okay, what is a citrus? So I kind of just looked because I'm like, hey, we're online. We have the internet. This is a uh, dish of dish. We talk about this. Series. And uh, it's not a citrus, but what actually is is it? And they say, okay, first definition of fruits here. And this is from, um, whatchamacallit, this is from thehealthy.com. There will be a link to this so y'all can check it out for yourself. So the definition of a fruit. So technically a fruit is a fleshy product that develops from the flower or tree, bush, or plant. It contains the seeds, and generally we think about the fruit as any sweet edible part of the plant. So scientists categorize fruits into groups based on how they are formed on the plant, simple, aggregate, and multiple. So instead, most folks instead most folks uh, sort fruits out into one of the unofficial but practical categories based on their skin, seeds, and flavor. Now, with most people, I think one of the typical ones that most people understand is like a tomato is technically a fruit. Then they go to things like a cucumber is actually fruits. Well, they kind of, sort of, kind of are. So there's kind of those kind of questions when you get into that. But yeah, 
So here they have the palm fruits, which is a core uh, of seeds surrounded by a comparatively large amount of flesh and covered with thin edible skin. Think apples and pears. Droops for stone fruits, uh, one large seed surrounded by a moderate amount of flesh and covered with a thin edible skin. Think peaches, plums, or apricots. Uh, citrus, pulpy insides containing a few seeds that are surrounded by spongy or leathery, indelible skin. Think grapefruits, lemons, and oranges. And that's why you can see that people think, okay, yeah, that seems like, that sounds like a uh, pineapple, but then where are the seeds? Then, um, and that's a key thing. Where are the seeds is a key thing to you understanding yeah. how the hell a pineapple actually grows. Okay, mm -hmm. berries, soft, juicy fruits and uh, con that contain many seeds, whether either on the outside or the inside. Think strawberries, blackberries, and blueberries. And melons, a large fruit from the ground from the gourd family, with a hard outer rind, firm insides, and containing many seeds. Think watermelon, cantaloupe, and honeydew. Then, of course, there's a tropical. Uh, these fruits are from tropical regions, and vegetables that are really fruits. This is like uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, avocados, squash, beans, and eggplant. And what type of fruit is a pineapple? And they say a pineapple, specifically speaking, is a multiple fruit because it forms from multiple flowers that fuse together. And again, that should You've, it's probably already on the screen. But yeah, um, pineapple uh, to me is, is really amazing. I just really like it. And there's a whole as other aspect that you can look up for yourself. They, there's something about pineapples that like eats your body as you eat them. So it's like a, a mutual, mutual consumption <laughs> when you're having pineapples. But yeah, um, hmm. so yeah, anything else you want to say about this? What are the other kind of combinations with the other things you said that switched out seasonally? Yeah, like I said, I mean, I remember citrus. Um, I want to say... I think there were apples another time of year. I'm trying to remember now. Um, but they would still use this kind of thing where they would switch out a version where the, they'd switch out the candied actual things for something. Then there'd be a puree version. There would be like a yeah, yeah. more like saucer version. So they would just switch out. Like I'm seeing here there's at least three. There's this candied version. Then there's a creamy type of thing. And then there's more like a blood orange. So there would at least be three different fruits to switch out for those things, right? Yeah, I want to say like there were apples one time of the year. Um, I'm trying to remember if there were pears at one point. Um, I'm trying to remember if there were blue. There may have been blueberries. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I think, but I think berries more in the summertime. Um, but like the basic, like I say, the components the same, and the other stuff just kind of swapped out accordingly. Yeah. See, like now I'm wondering, could you just do like an entire like veg version of this thing where you're switching out to like a vegetable based uh, based uh, candy? I guess we wouldn't even need the candy. Maybe you do like more. Of a like a salted, dried type of, um, what would they equivalent to like a vegetable? Uh, um, I, I've seen, I've seen uh, corn in desserts, actually. There's a place, Spot Dessert Bar on St. Mark's. They actually have a corn-based dessert, so you could do that because, I mean, corn's a bit sweeter. Um, trying to think what other vegetables I've seen in desserts. Um, you can use oh, I've, I've seen, oh, there's actually, there's actually one, well, one of the ones coming up here, there's actually um, candied tomato, so you could do that as well. Um, like, the, like, Vegetables that have a higher sugar content, yeah. That's a fruit, though. As we've been yeah. Having. Yeah, but I mean, like, people think the of tomatoes, it as... The tomatoes are technically fruit, so I was thinking, like, more like... Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying how, what, as far yeah, it, it's so far as how people think of it, but it's, yeah, it's because it's like... I mean, I don't know, I wouldn't... I mean, you're not going to candy broccoli or cauliflower, you know. <laughs> It'd be kind of strange. Yeah. 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 So jumping on to the next one here, sure. if you're ready to go. Yeah, all set. You can go to the crostata, which is served with, uh, served with apricots, blueberries, and lemon verbana gelato. Sure. So as you can see, this is sort of like a pie. Uh, crostata, though, there's almond paste in the dough. That's the one thing that makes it different. Um, you know, I like almonds a lot, so I think the flavor is very nice. Obviously, if you have a nut allergy, you can't have this because the nuts are... In, are already in the dough itself because i remember people asking could you do it without this and it's like the dough is made in advance once it's made i mean you can't really do anything um this was a summer version as you can probably tell this was another one the fruits were subject to change like i think we had an apple crostata i'm trying to remember if there is uh I'm trying to remember if there was a pear or what the other one was but i think this was but this was clearly a summer one because the apricots uh the blueberries were sort of cooked gently, similar to pie filling. Okay. And then the lemon verbena gelato. Yeah, we have a few gelatos coming up right up your alley. Um, the It was simmered with the herb, the lemon verbena in it, and strained off so it's smooth, but it has that flavor. Kind of um, lemon-like is in the name. But it had it had this kind of, I don't know, floral element is the right word. I'm trying to think of how to describe lemon verbena. But it, 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 it tastes different than just straight lemon, though, for sure. Very nice. And then there's a little bit of uh, lemon verbena as a garnish on the d dish itself. Yeah. Yeah, now, um, 
again, those who are more familiar with the Italian food, you can tell us if you've seen some of these, these things somewhere else, because some of these are, just, are rather new to me. But you see, they just have included the, the gelato there, which is makes it more Italianish. but then they can be boring the whole idea of everything else from, from other kinds of dishes and other kinds of cuisines. And uh, one thing Stephen had mentioned is the four C's are things that you look for when you're making desserts, which is citrus, uh, chocolate, coffee, and caramel. Those are yep. the four C's that you normally find in them. And then this one, of course, has lemon in it. And we can add crostata as a fifth C. fifth C coming in there. Crust stuff. Crusty things are normally also parts of well, desserts mm. and things like that. But yeah, sure. um, this looks good. But yeah, and you said you can see with some of these already how easily it would be to just swap these things around. So if someone really yeah. likes something, they can still have that same dish without with getting some diversity. And that's also how you keep your regulars... Um, entertained because they keep coming over and over again and Stephen has become a regular at quite a few places <laughs> I'm sure he's experienced this whole thing now I'm yeah. seeing here yeah. uh, go ahead um what was I gonna say um yeah I think I was gonna say you could even probably add the other you could do the other C's different versions of this like you could um maybe do apples but you could caramelize them maybe you could do yeah. something with chocolate um and a different fruit um you could you could you could definitely do different things. I mean, I think there's a lot of flexibility here. Um, it just occurred to me too. I wonder if you could use other nuts in the crust instead of almond. Maybe do something with peanuts or something with like cashews. Or I mean, you would have to change the recipe because the fat content and everything would vary. Because I know almonds are leaner and uh, there's lower. There's what is it? There's there's the mono was it mono or polyunsaturated fat I forget which but then I know like with cashews they're lower in fat but it's a different kind of yeah I don't know so you you you'd have yeah. to I think change the recipe a bit too but uh, you know I'm wondering yeah. what other flavors you could do different nuts with different fruits and things like that um like you could do like an apple probably walnut macadamia. thing maybe yeah that'd be good yeah you're looking for something that's, that's heavy in fat so you probably macadamia is if you want the nuts that you want to go with or something like that yeah. Hmm. okay yeah just check to also to make sure again on the internet this is this kind of thing that I. Don't we typically do that? If I have a question and I'm by the internet, I'm not really too occupied. I just look it up. So the difference between um, gelato versus ice cream. It says this is from Spruce Eats, which is a regular, <laughs> regular site that I check up when we're doing these dish and dish series. It's um, with gelato. I was going to go with like the one and the comparison with the other one. This is they have they have a handy chart here. So gelato, it's made with uh, whole milk. It's made with more whole milk than cream. And then ice cream uh, made mostly from cream. Gelato, no egg. Ice cream includes egg yolks. Gelato, around 5 to 7% fat. And for ice cream, minimum of 10% fat. Yep. Then gelato is churned slower, 25% air. And uh, for ice cream, can be as much as 50% air. Uh, gelato is stored and served at around 15 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is in Celsius. I'm not going to the math right now and uh <laughs> for ice cream it's served frozen around zero degrees fahrenheit now um with gelato it's a few classic flavors but as i mentioned they've done all sorts of different things in in, in rome when i when i first found them and then with uh, ice cream nearly endless flavors and uh, uh gelato is smoother silkier texture and then ice cream is a fine crystal texture so those are the, the general differences and I'm guessing, what what do you think gets that crystal texture? Maybe the egg yolks being in there and uh, more fat. Maybe the fat crystallizes. If you're using a minimum of that, then if it's higher fat content, if it gets cold, it might might crystallize. And I don't know. What do you what do you think does? Yeah, it? it's all. It's also as as they're getting at. It, it's the degree. It's how it's how it's frozen because if it's like a lower versus if it's a shorter versus a longer spinning time, that's going to affect how it freezes. Because remember that if um. If you saw a Cold Stone, that company, that was their selling point, slow churned ice cream. They argued like it's it's fattier, yeah. it's higher fat content, but they churn it super slow. And then with um, I know with sorbets, they there tends to be more ice crystals because the thing is, it's just, there's yeah, no absolutely. fat and sor there's no fat and sorbet. It's just a straight uh, fruit. And I might have mentioned, but at Eddie and the Wolf, we actually made uh, sorbet using liquid nitrogen, and liquid nitrogen they say is actually better to use because apparently ice crystals don't form. So. My friend Paul and I had fun when we got uh, liquid nitrogen in these um, like coffee urns, and we used to shoot it in into the uh, mixing bowl, and then we started freezing other things for fun, and like <laughs> we froze we froze Brussels sprout leaves and threw them, and they shattered and stuff like that. And I told my dad he's a chemist by trade, so he thought it was really cool. But it's like don't get any of that stuff on you, though. I mean, you you get the, like yeah. think I always think of the scene in Terminator Two with liquid metal, the truck spills, and he like breaks up. Yeah, you do not want that stuff on you. <laughs> those those yeah, those are rather accurate depiction right there. Yeah. 
And yeah, uh, that's that's the thing. Like, it's, yeah, as I said, mentioned actually. Now maybe this is just from I wasn't really trying too many different kinds of ice creams when I left because uh, I was in West Virginia. Then I went to the United States. I mean, I, sorry, I went to Rome. That was in 2007. Maybe I just hadn't had that many different kinds of ice creams, but I just remember finding a lot more different flavors of gelato when you just go to. But I guess Baskin Robbins started to do flavors. So yeah, that, yeah. Let me not say that. I was aware of Baskin Robbins and things like Ben and Jerry's, which they do all sorts of things. So yeah. So in that sense, maybe I think there would be different kinds. And the flavor combinations and things like that when it comes to um, when it comes to ice cream, but in my experience, yeah, because I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about the different flavors of gelato, it's like one thing. It's not like like chunky monkey where there's like <laughs> all kinds of things thrown in there. It's more like okay, this is pistachio gelato, this is coconut yeah. gelato, this is rice gelato, where it's like one flavor in the actual thing, but it's highlighted by the gelato itself. So I say that would be one of the differences that I see with the actual uh, presentations of these two magnificent desserts. But yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. So what else? Uh, anything else to say? No, the no egg type of thing. So over lacto or whatever the people are. Uh, now I'm trying to wonder. There's probably ways to do these with like coconut milk, so even taking out the milk and things like that. But there'll, there'll be certain aspects of you have to add fat or, or yeah. things like that just to make sure. And, yeah. Okay. So uh, jumping on to the next one here, and yeah. we have a prune con gelato, and that's five spice poached plums basil seed gelato and candied tomato yes yeah, so i took it this was a picture that i took in person because i thought i thought it was a really interesting dessert um not something i typically you know not something you typically see um so it's the as a as the name is it's um chinese it's a five spices it's the most common ones are um star anise uh cloves uh cinnamon Sichuan peppercorns and fennel seeds. I don't know if you've ever had Sichuan peppercorns, but they're um they're very interesting. You bite into them, your tongue almost goes numb a little. So it like it's sort it's like it's a it's a little different from a usual um peppercorn. And they say the reason they pair it is because Sichuan food tends to be very spicy. So this is to kind of offset it a little. And um, the different flavors work together. Like the licorice, clove has its own flavor, cinnamon. The pepper adds its flavor and then fennel as well. Um, I th I think again I think it can vary. Like sometimes they'll swap out like turmeric for one of them sometimes they'll swap out um ginger for one of them um sometimes um orange peel instead but usually it's like those five that i mentioned um so it's cooked in that liquid um you know the juice and then mm. the spice itself <coughs> um the basil seed gelato i think that's pretty self-explanatory um you know it tastes like basil plus you get like the crunch when you bite into it i kind of like that texture personally and the candy tomato i think it's just um I, w I didn't write down which type of tomato, but it's just sort of um, simmer gently, I think, in simple syrup. So it like sort of breaks down a little, you know, accentuates the sweetness of the tomato. And then this this little container here, this is the liquid that the uh, plums are poached in. And you just sort of pour a little more uh, table side, you know, just give a presentation and texture. So it's I, mean, I don't know if I'd say it's quite like a soup, but it's a little looser texture. That's what the chef wanted. Yeah. Is it uh, is it room temperature? Is it cold, chilled or what would they do with that? Yeah, this is chilled because if you think about it, the sorbet, um, the sorbet goes on. It's, um, I mean, it'll melt a little as you can see here, but it's supposed to hold up. It's not, uh, it's not a hot dish. Yeah. 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 Because I was wondering if you if you pour some, if you pour some even room temperature warmer stuff, it'll just completely melt through that. And that that's more like a weird soup, which would be kind of odd. I wonder why would they? So it's more like kind of like. Um, like a sundae, but more of like an Italianish type of sundae version where you're pouring something on top of it. Yep. Yep. I'd say so. Um, cause, cause if you think about it, like if you go, even if you go to like a diner and get like pie a la mode, like, and they heat up the pie, they've got to run it out to you right away. Cause like once that mm -hmm. ice cream goes on, it's going to start melting. So, um, it's not as practical to do that, especially the size of this restaurant. So, um, they, you know, this, this was, I mean, it was obviously warm when they cooked it, but then they cool it and they plated it last minute and brought it out like this. Yeah. Yeah, and as I mentioned, they have this a different thing like the basil basil seed gelato. See, it's not like basil seeds with like crunchy like wal walnuts and, <laughs> and and streaks and swirls of like caramel. It's just like the basil seed, and you're highlighting that in the gelato form, which is uh, something a bit different there. Yeah, this yeah, I, good, I, huh? man, I like I love basil personally. I like seeing it used in sweeter applications. Like I was discussing this recently with someone regarding. Um, 
tarragon because tarragon you typically see it in savory items but i had a tarragon ice cream which i thought was great and i think i think it's cool to see like basil ice cream i mean you could even do different types of i mean you could do like a thai basil ice cream it'd be more purplish you could do um there's a holy basil um there's lemon basil like you know you could swap all that stuff out i'm sure it'd be very interesting yeah, yeah. this interesting crystal dish it's being served in here yeah, some of these things you kind of wonder. I mean, these are the things where people kind of go around and they find stuff and like, okay, we're going to order like 500 so we can make sure we can have this for a while in case things break. Yeah, how often, I guess these, the places you've worked are rather professional, but how often do things break? So it depends on what it is. I, mean, I remember certain places I laughed. We used to wa laugh at like the bartenders who would break stuff all the time. And I was like, how do these people still have their jobs? We're like, you should break maybe like one glass a week, like max. Um, I understand accidents mm -hmm. happen, but there's a certain point where it's like, I don't get how you can be this careless and uh, it also it is partially management's fault like not not where i was but like i remember like a previous place i had worked where like i was noticing like every when i worked in the kitchen now and like this one bartender would set up and i'd hear her dropping glasses all the time and i'm like how does this woman still have a job it's like <laughs> how much money is going after her and, like again i get accidents happen but there's a certain point where it's like you're just being completely careless and it's like you know I don't, I don't know why that should slide, but I mean, like I said, may, I mean, maybe once a week. I, I don't have an exact number in mind, but I mean, realistically, if the person's a good worker paying attention, I mean, this shouldn't be an all-the-time thing. No. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, with somebody I know here runs a couple of bars, and she's saying, like, it's like, just, they just to switch out, like, 20% of the glasses, like, every every month. And like, that's crazy. A like, crazy yeah. turnaround. I don't know. I don't know how many it was. My sister would know better. She'd mention it sometime. But now with something like at restaurants, how often do the dishes change from your experience at working some places? Like, were you ever at a place when they did a change of like flatware or, or the platings or things like that? Like, who's is that the, the the owner? Is that the chef who's in charge? Is some manager? What's what's the kind of process of that? So seasonal, as you recall from our presentation, had some very interesting plates. And I think where that changed, what, fortunately, the advantage seasonal had was that because it was a smaller place, you didn't need that many plates. So it was easy to order like, you know, 10 or 20 of these and 10 or 20 of these or whatever. And I think what it is is that the chef would basically talk to the owner and he would say, oh, I have some new ideas about dishes. I'd like to serve them in these plates. I think it would look nicer. Then I think he would run it by the owner and then they would buy them from one of the suppliers and um, – you know, we agree like, okay, we're going to get this many of them and this is going to be served on this and maybe down the line we'll use it on another dish. And then like there's a few like standard white dishes that we just use all the time. And mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know exactly the numbers that go into that, but I mean, I'd imagine like, you know, you have to be somewhat realistic as far as, yeah, it would be cool to have a million plates, but it's like you're not going to spend that yeah. much money. How <laughs> often are you going to use them? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Now moving on to the next dish here. Now, for some reason, when I first saw this, I, I, I thought it was more like a seafood dish. It, it, I thought it was like fish. <laughs> I was like, oh, that looks like it could be like a fish fillet or like a jerky type of thing. But yeah, here's some um, banana panna cotta in airbags with a Negroni caramel, candied banana, candied banana peel over the top. Yeah, so this is interesting. So I don't know if you saw my photos of Bobo recently, but I actually had the airbag in the Amuse Bouche. It's actually, it's a very nice component. It's, it's some kind of like... Um, it's a thin layer of um, dough. I'm not sure exactly what's in it, but it, it puffs up like that, and you just sort of poke a hole in the middle so you can do it for sweet or savory applications. Uh, I think the one I had at Baba, I want to say it was, I think it was like a chickpea puree or something, but this, of course, is the panna cotta. Um, so Negroni, again, this is interesting, the Negroni, Negroni uh, caramel. Um, it's not, I don't think it's true caramel because it's not brown, like the sugar's not brown. It's more just sort of, um, it's, sort, it's sort of the flavoring, but it's simmered and then it like, it's cooled so it gets hard like that. And there's also a, a lighter uh, sauce. You can see that's the dots on the right. And then that the caramel's broken up over top. Candied banana, I think, I'm not sure how this is made here. It looks like it's, because it looks almost translucent. I'm not sure how he did that. I mean, I wish I had asked now. It looks really interesting. But um. A lot of people don't know that you can actually eat the peel, but the thing is the peel, obviously, because it's so tough, you have to cook the hell out of it. I remember um, Patello, a previous place, which I mentioned, we actually had a banana peel ice cream early on. Um, you, it, it actually has a lot of flavor, like it tastes better than straight banana ice cream. But again, it's like you got to like braise the hell, like you got to cook it down to nothing, basically, because it's so tough. But um the flavor gets really concentrated. It almost reminds me of like the banana runts, like the candy, but it tastes a lot better. But it, like it actually has that real like in-depth flavor. It's not just like the the inside is much more mild. Yeah. 
I mean, imagine he probably scraped out most of that fleshy kind of um, uh, starchy. I don't know. It, it seems starchy. You know, the stickier white stuff on the inside. He yeah. probably scraped all that out before actually cooking it. Then, because when you get to the actual yellow skin type of part of it, yeah, it's it that's relatively thin. So you could probably get this translucent look from it uh, rather yeah. straightforward. So he said these things. So they're normally like kind of, kind of the small little dollops when you first bake them, and then when you bake them, to, when you subject them to heat, they puff up. Yeah, I, I wish I had l- learned how to make these. Yeah, I wish I had known how to make learn how to make these because I saw they like I said they went on both sweet and savory dishes, so I think that's cool because they have different uses. Um, the the dough itself it has more of a neutral flavor, like it's not really too sweet or savory, but it works as far as holding up those things. So, like I say, there's chickpea puree. Um, there was another savory preparation with these. I forget what it was. And then here, of course, dessert, obviously. So you could probably even tweak the dough. Like you could probably sprinkle a little sugar on the outside, and make it sweeter that way, or maybe even put a little salt on the outside and do a more savory application. Um, I think I think the basic formula is good. I'm wondering. Yeah, I'm wondering if I wonder if there's a recipe in the book. I didn't really look for it, but it would. Um, yeah. No. Um. It's it's interesting. No. Um. With stuff like this. It's it's really cool looking the, the the crystallized so you have the things in different forms so you have the the, the crystallized section and then the sauce on the side it's like made in the same thing yeah it looks yeah. it looks cool and okay yeah, do, were there any other versions of this like what are the other things that you might think off top of the head that that switches out or was this the typical thing that they that they used with it this was only in season one part of the year um. If like panna cotta in general was on the menu, I think pretty regularly. Like typically, it was served the more traditional way, like in the little container where you um, because panna cotta means cooked cream, so you typically would get it served in the little uh, ramekins or something. Um, I, I think this was the only one they did like this, so where he actually piped it into a container. But that's that's as far as I remember. I mean, maybe he did other stuff. I just wasn't there for it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Now also like with stuff like bananas, what do you? I'm wondering, yeah, with some, something like bananas, when was the first time bananas were actually, I don't think, oh, I don't know, maybe they are endemic to uh, Europe, and then they just they got to the more tropical areas after, and uh, I, I'm not going to look that up, I look, looked up, uh, yeah. like, oh my god, it's like looking for something that's going to stick in my head, so where are bananas from, I'm going to look, <laughs> where are bananas from? But uh, and bananas are also another thing that most people have seen banana bunches. That's something that they're more common with. Like they know, like okay, when you order some bananas, you get them like in this kind of ring with like the many of their fingers type of things. You more, many people know that you're actually technically supposed. The way we hold bananas is technically like the reverse way that like monkeys, for example, would hold them. And but I think and. Fewer people know that when you get that thing of banana, it still becomes a, like a long kind of stalk of them. So there's like at least like on average, there's like ten layers of those things of wings yeah. going. Like that. But the bush themselves, the tree, it's like it's they, they, the reason like papyrus and things like that, papyrus came from like more like bananaish, like like uh, palmish type of plants. But it's they grow in these thickets of these banana bush thickets and things like this, where it's like one one initial banana grows and then from the roots of the banana, it's not like, technically they were seeds in the plant itself because like the original bananas have been slowly and slowly, um, sorry, sorry, they've been slowly, um, they've been slowly selected through like just more typical older style like uh, of, of genetic selection to get the seeds smaller and smaller and smaller. Because if you open a banana, you see the small black things Whereas the original one, when they found them, was like these huge kind of black seeds in them. So anyway, but the banana plant itself, the the trees grow in thickets because like little small shoots come out from like the bottom of the roots of the of the actual like uh, bigger trees, and then you can actually cut out that smaller little part of it, <laughs> little seed like that. Look at it's like a miniature kind of banana tree, and you plant it somewhere else, and that will regrow. So you don't actually need the banana plant, the banana fruit itself. To actually regrow like the actual banana that you have, so you can just have like one banana, just keep like grazing. So it's it's a it's a cool looking plant. I don't know which kind of climates it's actually going to be doing well with, but uh, but yeah. So it says bananas are one of the most commonly enjoyed fruits in the United States, and uh, so the Dominican, Panama, Peru, Nicaragua, Honduras. So I think they were from the Americas. I don't know if they were in where they originally came from. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah. So bananas. I, I like bananas. Yeah, I think it's I think I think it's interesting how strawberries I think are the only fruit with seeds on the outside. So I like I wonder evolutionary wise like kind of what goes into that because you think about everything else like because because what I've heard is that 
they, they were designed, they're sweeter, so animals eat them. And then, of course, they go through the animal, and that's how the seeds get dispersed. Then those grow into new plants. But I wonder why strawberry seeds evolved to be on the outside. Like, what um, what went into that, I wonder? Uh. Yeah, maybe it's because they're one of the few ones. I guess blueberries and things like that. There's also many other ones that are bushes. But then st strawberries are very low, low to the ground. Maybe, I don't know, maybe this it's, it, evolution is strange because maybe where they evolved, uh -huh. they were in a certain point where the ones that had the seeds on the outside were, while the animals are foraging through it, maybe they didn't necessarily need to be even be eaten. Like you could just brush against that plant and then the seeds will fall off. And I don't think this, I don't, I don't know where, yeah. where it would be. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to see one, etymology with the wonder, wonders of the, the universe. <laughs> the wonders yeah. of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm um, trying to see here now. <laughs> now this banana hole that we're down. Uh, we'll, uh -huh. we'll move on to the next one very soon. I'm trying to see etymology of bananas, plant historical cultivation. Banana trees cultivated in the Book of Agriculture. Ag earliest domestication of bananas was initially naturally occurring paranthrocarpic seedless individuals of the Musa Akuminata Banksil in New Guinea. So that's where they first found them. New Guinea was where they first found them. Now they're all over the place. So yeah, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a dish, that has bananas in it, any kind of banana dish you can think of. You're like, this is the cuisine from this only place and we need people from this place. Should we say, if you go back to like, oh, we need people from a location in order to have the cuisine. Should we say only people from New Guinea can make banana dishes? Like everything else that you have from other places that have banana is not uh, not food from that place? No, so humans, let's just admit that we are, we are we're humans. This is earth food. Let's just enjoy that. And now mm. we can move on to this, which is maybe uh, only for, for women. This is only women's food. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> for International um, Women's Month, this is uh, this is a dessert special for that, which is a mimosa passion cake. It is white chocolate, strawberries, mimosa flour, and uh, pastry cream and gold. I like gold. Yeah, yeah it's so a very, uh, very gay-looking dessert, but not quite as gay as the next one. <laughs> um, this was... Yeah. yeah, this was... Um, yeah, this was like it says International Women's Day. Um, the cake, I'm trying to think of if I'd compare it to a shortbread or something in terms of texture. Uh, for those who don't know, don't know, pastry cream, it's similar to um, creme anglaise, which is the basis for ice cream. So it's usually like milk simmered with egg. You gradually mix in. There's usually um, there's usually um, vanilla beans, of course, scraped into it. Um, then what was I going to say? Um, yeah, so then that's colored with the gold. Yeah, he used a lot of gold. I think it was mostly the gold uh, spray here. Um, then the flour itself, there's actually a mimosa flour. I'm trying to think if the white chocolate, yeah, I think the, I think that's the pastry cream in the middle. That's white chocolate on top of it. Then I think the flour, it's actually, I'm trying to remember if the flour itself is, yeah, the flour, you, you see a little bit of here. It's, it's hard to see, but like at the top, the very tippy top, there's that yellow kind of fuzzy thing. That's actually the mimosa flour. Um, looks almost like, I don't know, not not daisy or something, but like it has a kind of like yellow frilly outside. Um, then there is a more, I think that's more uh, cream along the outside with uh, the candied pearl. It's um, pearl sugar. It's basically sugar that's worked. So it looks like a little white pearl and he sprayed some more gold on it. Um, yeah, I wish I could remember what this is on the top here. If it's more, there's white chocolate and I don't know. Yeah, it's a cool looking dessert though. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a special. So yeah, it wouldn't yeah. be something that would come up, or did you do it like every year they would do it, or what was? But you, you don't work there that often, did you? Yeah. So well, so I so like different holidays he would do things like this, but I think he it was just subject to change. Like, okay, what's a good dessert for this holiday? I I didn't post any of the kosher stuff, although there's some of it in here. But I know on like Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, he had like Barolo braised uh, uh, brisket, be you know, and obviously no pork. Um, you know, they did like a salmon dish, things like that. And then there was like kosher desserts. I was actually reading yesterday that um, in the kosher diet, they're not supposed to have certain berries because they can't be cleaned as thoroughly or something. So like, you know, you would omit those items. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. So but, you know, he tried to tailor it based on what the holidays were. And then, um, yeah, the, ne the next dessert, similar story. I'll, when we, I'll get into that when we move on. Yeah. Yeah, we see yeah, the mimosa flowers, a lot of mimosa trees around here where I live. It's it's more like it's not even like a daisy, it's like a poof. It's like yeah. they're, they're very small poofy things. It's like um dandelion more. It's like a really shrunk down dandelion. You know, the white yeah. thing that kind of blows off it, it's just like that. It's like kind of like a small little firework. It's an interesting type of thing. But yeah, again, yeah, sure. it's it's I've talked about this before. 
like once we developed our brains and our brains actually being able to be very flexible and invent certain things and adjust to different things, our physical body got very boring <laughs> in actual yeah. like, uh, evolution where like plants, animals, insects, all kinds of things. There's so many more cooler things in the world like than, than humans. But yeah. Okay, yeah. Now here we do go to the next one. And um, this one is a pride dessert. And this mm -hmm. is a sorbet terrine with a watermelon, white peach, passion fruit, green apple, pea flower, blueberry, and uh, you said here yeah, the purees are the diff are the same flavors, which is kind of. Uh, I mean, they're talking about all these. Wait, so the purees are the same flavor. So the pure, oh, the purees on the sides, but ice cream itself is the is. Yeah, the purees, is, is, the purees is, are the, the purees are the respective flavors of those colors. That's what. Okay, I was that's, to say. that's the stuff on the plate. Okay, because I was yeah. like, yeah, well, why, why, why you call it passion? White, white peach. If it's gonna be the purees, so yeah, those are the different things. Okay. So there, there's actually a story behind this, why I posted it in part, because it's an interesting dessert. But this is the story. This is the dessert that got Rose, a.k.a. Pie Wife, to come into the restaurant to see me because uh, I posted this on my page. And she's like, wow, that dessert looks cool. I'll have to come in and get it. So she came to the restaurant just to get it. And I think she and her friend actually ate earlier, but she ordered just this dessert. And she timed it well because it was one of those things that I think this was like towards the end of Pride. And they had like a handful of servings left. And she got one of the last ones. I thought I thought it was a really... I thought it was a really cool dessert because, like I say, it's the different flavors here. Um, you know, obviously the colors of the rainbow. Um, most of these flavors I think you're familiar with. The pea flower is interesting, though. It's um, I'm trying to think how to describe it. It's um, it's more for color than flavor. It's kind of sweeter though. It had almost like a creamier texture. Like when you cook it down, it almost has like a creamier texture. So. We had it. I'm trying to think. We had a pea flower pasta. I didn't get to try that one, but I think there were pictures of it floating around online. So it's a bluish color. And then, of course, the blueberries themselves are a bit darker. And then, you know, you have the fruit on the side. The, um, let me see here strawberries, Cape gooseberries. Oh, yeah. There were actually, um, there were blueberries that were like these the, the sort of, the sort of, the sort of lighter looking berries. There's one at the top and there's one, um, there's, there's some closer to the bottom. There's like, these were actually, um, blueberries that were a bit lighter in color they tasted a little different if i recall you can also see a little candied rhubarb uh yeah and of course the gold spray on top to finish really creative dessert um i think i think the way you make it is you take like a you take a mold you pour in sorbet a certain layer probably freeze it another layer freeze it another layer freeze it you keep doing that so it stacks up and then you just slice a uh, piece out and put it on the plate um obviously make sure the plates are cold so it doesn't melt uh puree on last minute and run it out and spray last second yep and so they would have it for the entire month? Yeah, uh, if I remember correctly, yeah. It was like they made a bunch of it, and it was just like that was like the pride, the special dessert. Like um, the way it worked is that the menu listed the regular desserts, and then there would be a few that like the servers would have to go over verbally, and this was one of them. Yeah. Hmm. See the gooseberries over there, really yeah. underrated uh, berry. It's uh, yeah. really nice. And we still have them around here, but yeah, I remember as kids, just, just wait for it to get to the right. When you when you get it just right, it's it's rather excellent. And you <laughs> you find it in those little pods and you pull them out. Yeah, so. yeah and at Les Bollier, we actually dipped them in uh, caramel and put them on the plate upright. And it was cool because uh, what you would do is you would dip them in caramel and you would put them in like the way the caramel would congeal. They would actually stand upright. And then once they cooled, you would just put those on the plate. So it would like stick up with the leaf. It was kind of cool. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably, yeah, probably a cool presentation there. Yeah. Um, so with this one, you'd been there. Uh, I wonder, would this be a typical thing they would do every Pride, or would they switch out the flavors and just maintain the same kind of thing? I'm actually not sure. I mean, I didn't see anything from the past on this, but <laughs> I don't know. He might, he might have – I mean, I don't know. Maybe – I think he's creative enough that maybe like one year he probably did like a cake and then this year was a terrine and then I'm sure he probably mixed it up. I mean, again, I wasn't there long enough to know, but I'm sure. No, I think he's creative enough that he probably mixed it up. Like, I think there were certain things, like I said, with the kosher stuff where like every Passover, every Yom Kippur, he would serve certain things. But then other things were sort of subject to changes for the sake of creativity. Yeah. Okay. And terrine in general, it re refers to like the whenever you're doing something with a layer type of thing, or is it the, the sliceness? What's what does terrine normally refer? Because we've done terrines where it's more like foie gras terrine or some meat based one normally in the appet in the aperitivos. Well, it's typically I think it's typically the container that's put into because the idea with the meat terrines is that you put the meat in the terrine and you cook it usually in a water bath so it holds together, then you slice it. And this is like Similar idea, but obviously instead you're pouring sorbet into that like similar shape and then slicing it. So I think it's more the shape in general. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I mean, like, 
like classically pate it's the same sort of container but pate has to have pork and there's a higher fat content and all that whereas like um I don't know if you saw on that charcuterie board, but there was like a beef cheek terrine that was leaner. And then there was actually a rabbit terrine made with aspic. So that like had very little fat. So it's, but then a lot of those, like, like the rabbit terrine was based on gelatin. This is based on sorbet. So I think it's more the shape in the container it fits into. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now I think we'll jump on to the last one. To the yep. Lutimo. Lutimo, yep. uh, Lutimo Chibo. Uh, yeah. Okay. So here we just have a nice little package here, and uh, we have some different plates, two of them. We'll have them uh, on the screen uh, alternatively yeah. or sure. successively. And it's cookies that we're giving at the end as compliments. So tell us a bit about these various entertaining-looking cookies. I mean, biscotti, were they called biscotti there, or was it like biscotti? Yeah. I see some that are biscotti, but then, yeah. Yeah, so these were subject to change. Um, she, had, she had a lot of good cookies there. The cookies change, like, I guess, kind of seasonally based on what's available. So up top here we have cookie with pine nuts i'm not sure what's inside and then these green ones are the pistachio there was usually jam or something put in the middle biscotti um there were these little um i'm trying to remember in the bag itself there were usually these how would i describe them um not quite i'm trying to think they were like cherry flavored they were almost like canal shaped like in terms of like almost that egg shape I'm trying to remember what was in those, but it was like it was like a softer cookie, usually heated up to order. And then the bottom here, you have the black and white um, cookies. You can tell by the color. There's actually espresso in those. It's actually not chocolate. It's espresso, which is kind of interesting. Um, let's see here. Sesame seed brittle, pumpkin seed brittle. This was actually given to me for my birthday, uh, one of the birthdays I worked. So there's, there, I took a picture of this, and there's actually a picture of me taking the picture, and there's just a picture of me holding it and smiling. So <laughs> I thought that I thought that was kind of fun. Yeah, and um, yeah, the cookies were subject to change. I, I I gotta check in the book. I don't know how many recipes she has in here, but um, I know online she had a ton of like she had all these Christmas cookies and a lot of stuff. It was one of those things that you got you got a. Uh, you got dessert. They just automatically sent out a bunch of these to you, depending, yeah, depending what was um, available. Were those things yeah, kind of like like Madeleines or something like, like kind of yeah, yeah, in the that, bag? yeah, 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 yeah. Th thanks for mentioning that. They, those were Madeleines, but um, they were a little. They were a little moister, and she put like there was one with cherry, and there were a few other flavors. But yeah, they were a little softer, and they were baked in the sill pads. Yeah, really nice. Um, yeah, the, uh, there's Italian meringue cookies in here. There's uh, pistachio cookies. There's actually polenta currant cookies. That sounds interesting. I never had those. Um, mm. Yeah, and then there, there's like a few other. There's um, Oh, that's fine. There's actually pallet shinka in here. That kind of makes sense. We were talking about that in with Austria. Um, yeah. Yeah, and there's frangipan. There's, uh, two ter there's actually a limoncello tiramisu. That sounds really good. Oh, wow. Um, mm, yeah. Wow. That, is that, yeah, that's probably bomb. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably really good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder. Yeah, I, I'd rec like I say, I recommend everyone buying the book. I, uh, you know, I'd like to once I have a functional kitchen. Finally, I uh, definitely experiment with some of this stuff for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing we're planning on doing instead uh, with this. And I think out know, here there's, there's a picture of of the folks. Uh, we might we might put we might put the folks up. Um, yeah. So they came for an anniversary. You see the anniversary there, and yeah, what was the thing that they were being served with. I, I think they, they got to... it. I got yeah. like I gotta check the photo, but yeah, but yeah, it was, it was funny because I remember um, they came in. I remember my parents were gonna like go to a show or something for their anniversary, and originally they just came in to say hi. But my boss sent them out like all this stuff, like champagne, candy, <laughs> pasta. Which I was like, wow, I was like that's very generous, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, it was nice. They got to come in. They got to meet a lot of the staff, and uh, you know, I mean, they were they were really happy with everything, and you know, it was a really good experience for them. Um, let me see the picture here. Oh yeah, I'm trying it's to remember. Um, yeah, yeah, that was. That, yeah, oh, that was a cake we had. I'm trying to remember. I I had that cake, but I'm trying to remember what was in it now. Yeah, and you can see on next to my mom's right arm, there's some cookies. There was a uh, there was a um, sesame seed brittle that had black and white seeds in it too, so it looked really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's that's it. We got we got to the end yeah. now, and yep. this is this is how this, this series goes. And as Stephen mentioned, he's uh, he's we're, we're looking at expanding this into a situation where we get other people coming in to talk about things. Now we're getting in touch with certain people who actually have their own restaurants and have their own food, so we'll get them to come on. And also, they'll be part of the I Know Great People series where we will talk about more of what people do, and then also we have them the dish and dish where they can focus directly on the foods that we're making. I think Steve is a high, high expectation. He did tell us a lot about the burgers already when we were talking about this, the actual I know great people, but I'm sure he will.
will be even more than happy to um, to revisit them again and be more focused on this. And then, as Stephen mentioned, we did a separate one of Casa Lula where we talked about him going there a bit, and then we went through the cookbook a bit. So we'll start going to more of those. I'll start posting and putting more attention to like the things that I make. Some things I just trust out. So some days we'll just be posting, hey, this is a recipe that I just tried out. And then with Stephen, as he said, once he gets to more location, we'll go to more where we'll also start adding, trying to make actual recipes. Probably even get to the point where we say, okay, y'all have some recipes, maybe you can submit them to us and we can kind of do that. We do like some live times where we just have talks about food and we make some food together. We're, th we're thinking about this is one of the projects of the several projects that we're doing the Dying or Live channel on this location and other places you might be listening to this, you will find some notification in places to whatever central place that most of this will be on. But there's a lot more restaurants, and a lot more things. Steven's not going to stop eating anytime soon. <laughs> I'm not going to stop cooking or liking food anytime soon. So we will have a lot more of these. So Steven, uh, we talked about this before. It's a restaurant that closed. We talked about this again in part one. But just tell us a bit about your experience at Lydia and just your thoughts and memories of, of being at this now closed uh, New York, New York staple of sorts. I, I had a very good time there. I actually, I, I, I'd gotten laid off from Netta. I talked a little bit about that before, I think, where the place was struggling. So unfortunately, my position got cut because they couldn't afford it. Um, so I started applying to all these different places. I wasn't having luck. I was trying to get another management job. I saw that Felidia was hiring front waiters. And, you know, ideally, I wanted to go back to management. But I thought, like, OK, at least take a job, even if it's temporary, until I can find ideally what I want to do. And I thought with Felidia, OK, this is a good fit because, I mean, it's, you know, a famous restaurant. I mean, I had a roommate who worked at the one in Pittsburgh a while back. That's actually how I first found out about her. And I thought, OK, worst case scenario, I'm a server in a nice restaurant. Let's see what can go from here. And I, I sort of lucked out because what had happened was my predecessor put in his notice and then my boss approached me and said, would you be interested in going back to management? And I told him, yeah, that was my goal. And, you know, he's we sat down, of course, talked to the terms of it and everything. And um, it was cool. It was, it was kind of an unusual experience because I, I moved up in a fairly short time. So it's sort of the challenge of like you start on a lower position, then you jump up quickly. And now, like these people are answering to you. So, I mean, I could probably do a more in-depth discussion about that. But that's one of the challenges of like getting promoted from within. It's a challenge either way, because I think if you've been there a while and you get promoted, it's like you become friends with all these people, then you move up, and then it's like you have to tell people who are your friends what to do. Whereas if you're new, the challenge with that is that like they, they think, oh, here's this new guy who's in charge now. Like now he's telling us what to do. And there were people who would work there for like a decade plus. So like it's kind of a, an awkward scenario, but I mean that's like just something you have to deal with. And I want to, you know, my plan was to get to a point where like if I had stayed here for a bit, I would have gone and just started as a manager manager somewhere else. Because the thing is, if you start as a manager, it's like you automatically have that authority and that, you know, it's a different dynamic. But I mean, you know, it's just it's one of the challenges you have to deal with. Uh, again, sad it closed. But I mean, I understand why with the lockdown and everything. Uh, looking forward to Babo. Uh, Mom is going to get to meet. Let's see. Three of my wives and uh, a friend, as well as, as well as uh, two other friends. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. We'll take a lot of pictures of Bobo. I'm curious to see if anyone will get some of these dishes we've talked about. I, you know, I highly recommend all of them, of course. Um, even more dishes. I mean, I have even more photos, but I didn't want this presentation to go on for three hours. So uh, you know, could talk all day, but uh, looking forward to that. I also wanted to show you here. We can talk about this. Uh, we talked about Joe Beef with Laura here. I actually got the cookbook the other day. I got it um, via Amazon. So. Um, very interesting stuff. This, this is the place that has the foie gras double down and other stuff. So maybe we can talk about this in a future discussion too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So as, as Stephen mentioned, unfortunately this place has closed, but this Babo. So uh, with Babo, once he comes and he adds the the, the Babo experience there, maybe uh, we'll also add the other pictures and things that he has from Felidia to to that discussion on on that day that we do that. But it is more on Felidia. So this restaurant will. It's not the last time we're hearing from Felidia. If there's more yeah. pictures, we, we we shall get to those as well. Because as as you mentioned, it's not just that you can go to the place, but you can also get inspired by these. And I'll, I'm also interested in seeing. Um, the actual things. It's, it's part of why I want this series to be just kind of just sharing information about uh, about dishes and dishing on dish, and that's kind of what we do here. And I and I hope you all have enjoyed it as much as and I, <laughs> Stephen and I enjoy talking about these things. Yeah. And and I highly recommend everyone check out the book. It is available on Amazon, even though the restaurant closed. And she has a ton of books. I mean, she's had books like from coming. She's been. I don't know when her first book came out. My guess is probably like 80s or early 90s. She has numerous cookbooks she has my american dream that's a memoir she has felidia i don't know if there's any book regarding babo i mean i think vitali you know wrote some books when he was around um but you know i'm, I'm sure you know too, though, right? yeah 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, all, all this, I mean, you can go to Italy, like I said, I mean, they sell this stuff there. So even though the place is closed, I mean, you can still enjoy this, whether it's recreating the dishes or going to one of the other restaurants. So I think the hopefully these other places will be around for some time for everyone to enjoy. Yeah, yeah maybe you can do it in the bar one. Or if you do go, eventually, when you finally visit Italy, maybe we can include the Felidia dishes on that one, because they will be more like a walk through the place. And you can maybe take pictures of just the interior. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure yeah. it out. But there'll be more yeah. on that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I right, think cool. that's it for me. I've got nothing else to say, Stephen. You can stay on a bit longer after this kind of close up. Sure. Sure. But uh, that's been Dish on Dish with Felidia. This is part yeah. two. Stephen, uh, say goodbye to the peoples. Goodbye, everyone. Hope you enjoyed. Right. Goodbye.